Australia's massive debt. Let's have a look. Hello everyone, Florian Heiser here and welcome to another episode of Heiser Says. I've got my stein of coffee that I'm working through and I thought we'd have a look at this article from news.com.au written by economist Jason Murphy. His take on the massive debt that Australia is racking up. You know, the deficit, well, it's at World War II levels. If we jump over here to the debt clock, it looks exciting and is shooting up crazy. Not as exciting as the US debt clock, um, clock I mean. They're talking trillions, guys. They're talking trillions. We, we, we can't even compete. We can't even compete. So just think about that. Think about that from a comparison. You know, who's looking worse? Although our economy isn't, isn't the level of complexity as the US, nor as complex, nor as large. You know, there's a reason why Australian businesses, all the big ones, have a big presence in the US. Why some of them even list on the US exchanges before here. Why they want to crack that market. Why they want to crack that market. So let's, let's have a look at this. How the economy will survive massive debt from the pandemic. Australia's economy is facing a meltdown. Our only hope of avoiding calamity is doing the one thing that we've been warned against for years. Well, the economy, the economic and fiscal update is out and things are grim. Australia's economy is shrinking and the unemployment rate is rising. Also, we're going to be running deficits for the previous financial year and the current financial year. They are big and they will add to the debt. I mean, there you go. 85 billion and then 184 billion dollar deficits. They were almost, almost, a you know, break even point with regards to the budget. Now I made the bar graph, the bars in the graph above red. Red is a danger color, but I do not want to alarm anyone. Deficits are good right now. Right now, government spending is the last defense against total calamity. Without JobKeeper, hundreds of thousands more Aussies would be out of work. Without JobSeeker, many more would be struggling to pay the rent. There are actually some healthy signs in the Australian economy at the moment. Government spending, those deficits are why. The Treasurer gave a press conference to announce the economic and fiscal update on Thursday. Journalists wanted to ping him over what these deficits will do to our national debt. The next graph shows our national debt over three years from before the pandemic to the current financial year. Net debt will rise because of those deficits. The government will borrow money to finance its spending, and it does that by selling bonds, which it promises to repay later. The bonds are bought by foreign governments, big super funds, and hedge funds, providing the government with cash. There we go. Net debt is rising from around 25% of GDP to around 36%. It's not high by international standards. Japan has debt more than 200% of GDP. But is it even a little bit, is even a little bit of debt bad? If you've been paying attention to Australian politics, you know some people think it is. For a long time, Australian politics has been obsessed with debt. Remember former Treasurer Joe Hockey? He used to go on about what he called a debt and deficit disaster. But focusing on debt is the wrong move. When government spending is helping Australians stay in work, we should celebrate the spending. But what work is it? I mean, we're, in, we're incurring, you know, the government's incurring a future liability to pay those bonds, to pay the interest. Even if they refinance it, they're gonna, there's still going to be tax money that's going to be siphoned over to these bondholders. We're going to be farmed for future generations to fulfill this commitment, to keep people in jobs. Are they jobs that need to be kept? Some businesses, we, we've heard it before, the amount of insolvencies has fallen. It's fallen significantly. How many of them are zombie companies? How much of the debt is being incurred to keep prop up zombie companies? And the, I mean, the thing is, the government has locked down the economy. They've forced people into this situation. But we're also in a situation where, well, no one is prepared for any tough times, any calamities. You've got the state on your back. You've got, a, you've got a mentality where the state will come and rescue you and take care of you. Some people are living paycheck to paycheck and haven't even thought about having a reserve. Why would you? So this was true in the GFC when labor spent up big and is true now. We're in the biggest economic meltdown since the 30s and anyone peering at the debt score what is absolutely missing the main game. Well, here's the thing. 
here's the thing. One of the aspects of the Labour government spending during the GFC was education, building the education revolution, pumping money into education, pumping it into education, you know, improving our quality of education. I'll show you this chart. It hasn't worked. It hasn't worked. For anyone involved in the construction game who has, was even close to any of these bare projects, the waste was insane. It was insane. Like big contractors would win these projects and then farm them out to the little guys. Schools would be forced to demolish buildings to replace them with something they didn't need. They'd be taught, dictated to what they would get, where it would be put, and it wouldn't actually meet their requirements. You've got schools in the middle of nowhere with indoor tennis courts and all these other preposterous things. The Catholic schools who had more control over it, they got much more value for their money. They got much because it was, you know, the private sector. So it's quite interesting to see the comparison. But it was inflated. It was highly expensive. And in some ways, it was the broken window fallacy, guys. Because we're still paying back. Well, paying that back, that debt. This is the deficits, guys. This is the deficits. The debt's still going up. The debt's still going up. So it's future taxations that will be dragged out of you one way or another through your pay-as-you-go, through your petrol tax, through everything that's taxed. If you add up all the taxes you pay as a, you know, as a citizen, it's quite significant. It's quite depressing, really. Most people don't realize it. They don't, they don't understand. A lot of people don't even pay any tax. So and here's the thing. Do we want to incur this debt? You know, what's the opportunity cost here, I ask? Of course, labor is crossed at the government. The same government that gave it a hard time over debt and deficit is now building up debt via big deficits. The natural instinct will be for pay pack. They should instead take the opportunity to move, to move our national debt onto something more useful like making sure the government spends fairly. Why are universities excluded from JobKeeper, for example, when they're such a big export earner? Well, there's a lot of fat in universities. There's a lot of fat in universities, you know? We see budget deficit going up, gross debt going up, net debt growing up, GDP is up, business investment is down. See, here's the thing. The more this de de debt grows, the more it grows, the less ability there will be for the state in the future to reduce the burden on the citizens. That's the argument I put forward. That's why it's a bad thing. Sure, you want economic stimulus now. You want economic activity now. You want confidence now. And this is one response, it's an interventional response. It's encouraging the, the, biz, the uh, governments to pump money into the economy, to flood the economy, to flood it with activity. And there's some people who will be confident, some people who will be doing well now. But th there's a future burden that we have to pay. So the, you know, the chance is, the push will be to, to inflate it away. Inflate it away. But how do we pay it back? Interest rates are crazy low right now. Last week, the government could borrow $2 billion for 10 years and is paying interest of 0.83% on that. The cost of servicing our debt is going to be low. That's good because the plan should not be to pay it back anytime soon. Think about a mortgage. When your parents bought their home back in the day, they had what seemed like an enormous mortgage. Flash forward 30 years and the amount they borrowed seemed tiny compared to the value of the house and compared to how much they make in a year. But well, look at it. What was that? What was that? What was a house? It's an asset that you can live in that has capital appreciation over time, hopefully, that you can raise a family in. Now, what if you borrowed that money and then spent it on crap? Would that be good? On useless, frivolous things. Let's compare it to that. What do you think our government is spending the money on? How much of it is actually invested in infrastructure? Why is our power so expensive here in Australia? One of the highest in the world. Why is there so much bureaucracy and red tape on starting up a business? You know? Maybe, maybe, you know, I, I, if the government is going to take on piles of debt, let's invest in things which will future proof our nation and our civilization for cheaper power, cheaper exports, actually allowing us to compete on an equal footing with other nations. Why is our potable water so low as a proportion of the population? Why don't we have a bigger buffer? You know, those crazy ideas? Maybe, maybe borrowing money and then just uh, reducing our taxes for 20 years. Wouldn't that be good? Your parents had to pay back the mortgage, though, because unlike, the, unlike a country, a person gets old and retires. What a country can do is keep the debt on its books and just grow the economy through the magic 
of economic growth and inflation, the debt will get more and more manageable. This is why the treasurer talks about using economic growth to pay off the debt, not raising taxes to pay off the debt. The former chief economist of the IMF made the same point last year. So long as your interest rate on borrowing is less than your economic growth rate, debt shrinks and deficits are not a problem. So the plan for Australia is this. We don't pay the debt back. We use the time and economic growth to make it look piddly. But here's the problem. Our population growth is completely dependent on, well, it's a big portion of it, on net overseas migration. That's stopped. That's stopped. Is that going to return? What do you think? Is the Ponzi scheme going to keep going? A gift from the Greeks. The people worried about debt often want to cut government spending. It's very important that we don't. Not right now, at least, to see why let's look at Europe. In the middle of the last recession, the GFC, the Europeans were worried about debt. Many took on a policy called austerity, which involved cutting spending. It caused economic growth to fall further, and the result was completely paradoxical in some cases. They harmed the economic growth so much that it became harder to manage debt rather than easier. Reducing government spending is like closing down factories. It costs jobs and hurts people. Well, here's the thing. Here's, it just shows you that we've become dependent on this redistribution, on the money taken from one group, processed through the government and put into another. It means the, the market isn't as free as it should be. It means it's too interventionist. So that's why I'd advocate for looking at some special economic regions around Australia, some special economic zones to experiment with new ideas. So that if, if you wanted to, if you wanted to have lower taxes, or if you didn't want to pay GST, you could move to a certain city. Oh, oh well, you also don't get minimum wage. You know, why don't we try something bold and new? Do you think there's a political will for it? Do you think the Karens will allow it to happen? I would be shocked if it would, but it needs to be put on the table. People need to become more politically active and need to realize that, well, a slide into socialism isn't the only solution. Getting the government off your back could, could have benefits. So there's a horrible, ironic part of this story. The theory that austerity was the best policy was based on a lot of academic work including a very famous academic paper by two Harvard economists called Reinhardt and, and Roghoff. The paper came out in 2010, and it said debt was bad because it caused growth to be lower. One person bothered to check their working, a young man in his 20s called Thomas uh, Herdon. What he found is they made a mistake in a Microsoft Excel spreadsheet that totally undermined their conclusion. It took a while for people to pay attention to what young Mr. Herdon was saying, but eventually they did. We can now move forward knowing that research is flawed. Debt is not necessarily a problem if you have continued inflation growth. So what, what do you think, everyone? What do you think? Should we not worry about debt? Should we not worry about the government increasing it? Or should, if it's inevitable that they're going to do it, should we push, should we push for that debt to be deployed to ways that can eventually, eventually reduce our dependence on the state? can stop this redistribution. I mean, what if the government, you know, why why are we even bothering about taxes? Just borrow, keep borrowing forever. Keep borrowing forever, guys. Well, why can't that work? Let me know your thoughts and opinions in the comments below, everyone. Please like, share, and subscribe to the channel. Are you concerned with the government debt? What are you doing to mitigate it in your personal life? Do you think, you know, the fact that this depends on the continued growth of our population. Do you think they will encourage people to have children? Or is it going to result in the country just opening up the borders? Can they even do it? Let me know your thoughts and opinions down below, guys. Thank you all for watching. Like, share, and subscribe to the channel. If you're a fan and want to support the Con and I create here, there are a few ways you can. You can join the channel on YouTube or Patreon. You can support us using our affiliate links at Amazon, eBay, Independent Reserve, or KuCoin. You can buy a merch from Heiser Says. You can use Gold Pass from the Perth Mint or support us via PayPal. Take care, guys. I'll see you next time.